have you ever noticed that most of our tools and machines are meant to be used with the right hand? From scissors to notebooks, doorknobs to driving controls, car readers to can openers, we are surrounded by objects that were designed with a right-handed person in mind, tools that are more challenging to use with the left hand. This preference exists because about 90% of the people in the world are right-handed. Left-handedness is actually quite rare. Something about genetics seems to make more people right-handed than left-handed. But that's not the only way that genetics seems to play favorites. Dark hair happens more than light hair, curly hair happens more than straight hair, and brown eyes occur more often than blue. Some traits that you can't even see are like this, like a person's blood type or their risk of certain diseases. There are a lot of different ways to be human, so why is it that some traits are so much more common than others? That's a question people have wondered about for centuries, not just for human beings, but for other animals and plants too. The first person to make a solid step toward the answer was ignored for decades. It wasn't until other scientists discovered the same things that people realized he had been right all along. I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. In today's lesson, we're going to learn all about Gregor Mendel and why he is widely considered to be the father of genetics. Hello and welcome. I see Amira watching in Minnesota. Hello to Belen and Nadia watching in Germany. Noah in Utah, Kaylin Derek, Claire from British Columbia. We're super excited to explore the question of how traits are inherited and to introduce a famous scientist named Mendel. So last time we talked about reproduction and how some organisms can clone themselves, creating identical copies, but that is not the case with this litter of puppies right here they each look different. They've inherited genes from both parents. Yes, and with sexual reproduction, you have variety. Every single individual is unique. But how do you know which traits are going to get passed on? This is a question that people have wondered about for thousands of years, and there were lots of different ideas. One of them was called Lamarckism. That's named after some guy named Lamarck. That's right. right. And the idea of Lamarckism is that acquired traits are inherited. So for example, if, you know that, that nursery rhyme, the three blind mice that have their tails cut off? Ooh, yeah. If there was a mouse that had their tail cut off, then that mouse would have baby mice that would not have tails. That's right. the idea of Lamarckism. Thank you. And that can't be right. So you should rate this in the notes. Give it a rating. Would you give it zero stars, one star, four stars? Do we have lots of evidence for this? Or can you think of lots of contradictions? So this sounds to me like you're saying, like, oh, I want my kids to be good at math, so I'm going to study lots of calculus so my kids will be born knowing math. And I don't think that would work. It does not work. It does not work. So Lamarckism is now an idea that has been, for the most part, discredited, although sometimes the environment can affect the genetics. And one of the more popular ideas to support things like Lamarckism is this question of why do giraffes have long necks? Mm. Is it because they're reaching for leaves that are tall in tall trees? It's so like they're stretching, so their necks are stretching? Yeah, and so then each generation the necks get a little longer? Hmm. Or does it have to do with the fact that they actually fight using their necks? So this is sped up. This is not real time. It's sped up to be just a little bit faster. But it still gives you an idea for just how aggressive giraffes are <laughs> when they have those battles swinging their heads around. That was from a Discover Education clip there. And wait, so you're saying giraffes don't have long necks because they're stretching the how and why giraffes have long necks is actually still a matter of debate among scientists. But it, yeah, it seems to be a combination of their food source being high and the fact that they use their necks when they battle each other. Combination of different things. But back to this idea of Lamarckism, how would you rate this math, Dad? Would you give this one star, five stars, I mean four stars? 
boy, I'd give it very few stars. I mean, if I averaged the votes I saw in the chat, it came out to like half a star. Half a star. So we can think of lots of contradictions with this, right? Right. Acquired traits are not inherited. Just because math dad knows calculus, that doesn't mean our kids are going to be born knowing calculus. And if a rat loses its tail, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you'll have a population of rats that don't have any tails. Okay, so that's... The difference there is that those traits are acquired later, yeah. and there's, there's no reason to think those are going to get passed on. And another very similar idea to Lamarckism is called pangenesis. And this idea says that, you know what, the way things are passed on is by these tiny little particles called gemmules that come from every part of the body. So if, for example, you had a cat and that cat burned its leg so that there was no hair growing in this area, then the little gemmules from that area, when they were transferred to the next generation, they would say, ah, on this leg, no hair should be grown. And you'd have cats that also would have no hair on their legs. That sounds even crazier. So just like Lamarckism, <laughs> we give this one about a half a star. We say, no, we can think of lots of contradictions to this. This does not explain what we see with traits. But this theory came about because they were trying to come up with some explanation. Like, how does the offspring know what traits its parents had? That's right. Another idea, and this one we do see some evidence of, is called blending. Mm. So with blending, a red flower and a white flower, if they are crossed, the offspring is pink. You get in between. And you can probably think of people that you know where one parent is super tall, the other parent is short, and the kids are not either just tall or short, they're often in between. Yeah, you, you do see that, and it kind of makes sense, especially if you're going to get somehow genetic information from both parents, that you would be somewhere in, in between that. It sounds plausible to me. And on, on the picture here, we're seeing the butterflies, and we have the light colored butterfly, the dark colored butterfly, and then all of the offspring are somewhere in between, sh shades of gray. Um, so that, that sounds kind of plausible to me, although I do see a weakness. What's the weakness? Okay, so, so well, how could you ever get a darker butterfly then? If, if you're always going towards the middle? Yeah, so, so over time, this generation would be more and more gray, and the generation after that would be more and more gray, and yeah, pr pretty soon there would be no light butterflies or dark butterflies. They'd all be somewhere in between, and I know that doesn't happen. Yeah, so that's a contradiction, and so is this adorable little guinea pig right up here above me, because if this guinea pig and this guinea pig were going to have the colors blended together, you would expect something that would be in between tan and black, kind of like a dark brown, right? Yes. But this little guinea pig is a spitting image of that parent, so there's an example where blending did not happen. All right, and in the chat I'm seeing twos, threes, and fours. I saw a lot of three stars and two and a half stars. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this one two and a half stars. These were the ideas to explain inheritance that were popular at the time that Gregor Mendel lived. He was a scientist who lived in what is now present-day Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic, and he was a biologist, biologist, a mathematician, a meteorologist, and he also lived at a monastery where he was the friar and then eventually the abbot of the monastery. And he was really curious if he could do some experiments to understand how traits were inherited. It's a good question. Hard one to answer. It is a tricky one to answer. On page 16 of the notes, we have a quick little fill in the blank for you, and we'll go and answer this real fast. So the question of how traits were passed on was one of the most pressing questions of the time in science. And popular ideas to explain it included Lamarckism, the idea that traits could be passed on to offspring, which we just said is not the way it happens. In the 1950s, Mendel conducted experiments to discover how inheritance worked, and he wanted to study mice. Mm. But doing experiments with mice, the person who was in charge of the abbot at the time said, no way, we are not running a whole bunch of experiments with mice, and so instead he switched to pea plants. Those are a lot less messy. They are. <laughs> and he grew pea plants and studied their traits. His experiments were conducted in a small garden next to the abbey, and his conclusions were incredibly advanced for the time. He is considered the founder of modern genetics. Or sometimes even called the father of genetics. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk just a little bit about peas, because to understand Mendel's experiments, you need to know something about how peas grow. 
One really cool thing about the pea flower is that it doesn't need to be pollinated. So if you had a garden of peas and there were no bees around at all, it wouldn't matter. The peas are self-fertile. That means they they pollinate themselves. Okay. And you have different traits in these pea plants. Some of them have white flowers. Some of them have purple flowers. And so Mendel decided that he would do an experiment and he basically gathered a little army of white pea flowers that would only produce white flowers. And then he gathered a little army of purple pea plants that would only produce purple flowers. Oh, like in separate gardens? Separate you... gardens. Okay. And he made sure they were true breeding. That means the white would always produce white, the purple would always produce purple, okay. and then he cross-pollinated oh. them. What do you think happened, Math Dad? The white and purple battled each other, and only, there could be only one survivor. So who is the winner? Oh. Um... Or would you see blending? Would you get pink? Ooh, that's a good question. No, I, th I think purple is going to win. Purple did indeed win. And the way that he did this was very time consuming because since pea flowers will pollinate themselves, if you want to cross pollinate them, you have to go in with tiny tweezers, remove the stamens that have the pollen. Then you have to take a tiny paintbrush, gather pollen from a different flower, and then come back and put it on the stigma of the first flower. So that's how he did this cross pollination. I'm, I'm totally picturing Mendel out there in the a bumblebee suit and go bzz, bzz, as he <laughs> pollinates his little flowers. <laughs> the, I don't think there was any buzzing or bumblebee suit happening, but who knows. <laughs> so the result of this first cross was that all of the flowers were purple. Because dark colors always win, right? Dark colors actually don't always win. Oh. We'll get into more into that later when we talk about pigmentation. But the result of Mendel's experiment was that all of the colors were purple. But do you think these purple flowers were identical to these ones? Well, there must be some difference. He decided to find out. So he did another cross. He took his F1 flowers. That's what we call this first generation, is the F1 generation. These are the parents. And he okay. took this F1 flower and then said, okay, now we're gonna self-pollinate those. We'll let them just produce their own seeds. And what he saw surprised him because there was a mathematical ratio. It was always three parts purple to one part white. Whoa, so what, some, some of the flowers were purple, some of them were white, but it were three times as many purples. Yes, white showed up again. So in this first generation, there was no white. All the flowers were purple, but then in the second generation, the white appeared. So they call that F2? Yep, that's the F2 generation. And think about if you were doing this with animals, if Mendel had gotten his choice and been able to experiment with, with mice or with cats, you would have seen something like this. So you wonder what's, what's gonna happen if you mix a black cat and a white cat and all of the offspring, all of the kittens are white. And you think, well, that black trait is just gone. I guess I won't have a lucky black cat. But if you took two of those white cats and crossed them, all of a sudden a black cat shows up again. What is going on? Whoa, now would this happen every time? This happened with all of the traits that Mendel studied, okay, a so three it... to one ratio. And on page 17, there's a little spot in the notes. I want you to really think if you had been Mendel and you had seen this, what would your ideas have been? Right. So in this case, the black cat skipped a generation or the white flowers for Mendel skipped, some, a generation. Uh, skipped a generation. Yeah. How is that happening? Yeah. Well, and to happen in such a way that the ratio seems so consistent. Because Mendel was a mathematician as well as a biologist, he came up with an ingenious idea. And this is why we still talk about him hundreds of years later and why he is so famous. He said that, aha, the only way this works is if each individual has two copies of the genetic information. So the round peas that always produce round peas, they have two copies of something that makes them round. The wrinkled peas that always have wrinkled peas, they have two copies of something that makes them wrinkled. But then each one just gives one copy to this next generation and the round is dominant. So that's why you don't see any wrinkles. Round is stronger than wrinkled in this case. Yes, but then in the next generation, this three to one ratio shows up because now you ha don't have only that round one to give, you also have a wrinkled one. 
So, we'll explain this one more time. So Mendel wasn't just you doing looking at the colors of the flowers. He was also looking at the shapes of the, the peas themselves. He was. He was looking at many different traits, and he saw this same thing over and over again. So let's go through this one more time, this okay. idea, because this is this was so revolutionary for Mendel's time. So he said, aha, with the white flowers, you have two copies of information, two factors. Today, we call them genes. Mendel called them factors. And it's going to give one to the, the offspring. And the purple one has two factors as well. It gives one to the offspring. But purple is dominant, so that's why this F1 generation was purple. Aha, uh -huh. so purple always wins. Purple always wins if there's a purple and a white. But then when you, when you self-pollinate that F1 generation now, there are four different possibilities of things that can happen, and they're all equally likely. Whoa, okay, so let me see if I understand what, what's happening here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw this out. So you had white, purple, white, and purple, and you're saying each one of those passes either the white or purple copy of the gene over and that, that's what's resulting in this. So let, let's, let's see if we get all the possibilities. So I could do white and white. So I'm going to write it down. White, white. That's right. You could get both white copies from the parent and that gives a white flower. Or I could do white and purple. And then that would be purple, just like the F1 generation. Could, and there's another way you can get white and purple. So you could do purple, then white. And that's purple, just like the F1 generation. Or, but you could also get two copies of the purple gene. Pur purple, then purple. Oh my goodness, and that, so that is four possibilities, and three out of those four have at least one of the gene copies being a P, so that's why we got three purple ones. Three purple ones the and one The ratio is three white. to one. Yes. Ah. The, the fact that Mendel kind of figured this out going backwards really is a cool and a big leap, a cool discovery and a big leap in science. But when he discovered this and wrote a paper about it, he was ignored for decades. Nobody really understood what had happened. This idea here in the little comic on page 18 that each individual has two copies of genetic information, this was revolutionary, that they got one from each parent. He published his paper, it was in German, and he went to a conference, he presented it, but people didn't really understand what it was about. They thought he was just talking about hybridizing plants. And they were uh, like, yeah, yeah, we, we hybridize plants too. We make hybrids. We know all about that. And Charles Darwin and other famous scientists who were alive at the same time never even heard of this research. It wasn't until 30 years later when someone else discovered the exact same thing that they made the connection. Of, oh, wait, Mendel already said all of this. Mm. Well, I don't know. When you talk in German, you sound smart. Wenn man in Deutsch spricht, ist man klug. Math Dad is a big fan of the German language, but really, <laughs> what you say matters a lot more than the language you say it in. That's true. And unfortunately, Mendel's results were not appreciated when he was alive. It wasn't until decades later that we realized what he had done. Oh, they're very much appreciated today. All right, it's time for What's That Critter? See if you can guess from our three clues what animal this is. This critter can migrate over 3,000 miles in a year more than any other land mammal. What critter are we talking about here? What animal is it? I'm seeing guesses for deer, an antelope. Okay, these are good guesses. Let's look at clue number two. This critter can run up to 50 miles an hour, or 80 kilometers an hour, which is super fast. They're that is really fast. I'm seeing guesses for white-tailed deer, some for caribou. Mm. Okay, third clue here. This critter has knees that make a clicking noise when they walk so the animals can stay together in a blizzard. No way! What an amazing adaptation! <laughs> no kidding. If, if my knees make a clicking sound, that's usually a bad sign, but apparently that's a feature, not a bug for these. And... Other guesses for antelope and for deer is the pop... Oh, Lyndon's got it. Reindeer and caribou. Good job, Natalie. Oh, it's a caribou. That, that is correct. Well done. Head over to itempool.com slash science mom slash live. It is time for our poll questions. 
And Science Puppy is here to cheer you on. See if you can answer these questions based on what we just covered in class. True or false, peas do not need bees. They can pollinate themselves. What do you think? Is that true? Can pea plants just pollinate themselves and it doesn't matter if there are bees around? Hmm. Some out job been outsourced to foreign lands. <laughs> bees are pretty important. But it turns out that not all plants need them. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Kaladin? What do you think, Science <laughs> Puppy? He's like, I'm just ready. I'm just here for the treats. And the cheering, too. He says, good job. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and reveal this answer, and we'll go to the next question. Okay. And this is true. Peas do not need bees. They're able to self-pollinate. Okay. True or false, if a cat burns its foot and loses all the hair on one leg, there's a good chance that its kittens will have hairless legs. Hmm. What do you think, Kaladin? And we had a great question in the chat. Why is there a times and not a plus when you're talking about, you know, the white flowers and purple flowers? Mm. That's just the tradition, the convention is to use a little time sign or when you, when you make a cross. I'm not exactly sure why. Yeah, because I guess most people would think a cross should be vertical. I, I was gonna say it's because it's a cross, and there's wait, crosses are vertical. I, I don't know. Um, we'll have to do some research, see if we can find out why that became the convention. But that's just. But the it, it definitely tradition. is the convention. Yeah. Yep. When we're talking about genetics, we usually will draw and write out crosses with a little cross sign. Okay. The votes are in, and they're saying this is false. The, I, cat that burns its leg is not going to pass on burned leg genes somehow. That would be an acquired trait. And just like I can't learn calculus and expect my kids to inherit that, it's just not, not going to work. Yep. Acquired traits are not passed on. And that is our next question, actually. So the, the idea that acquired traits are passed on to offspring is known as Mendelian inheritance, Lamarckism, or blending. Which one of those terms is the name for the idea that was popular when Mendel first was doing his research? This was one of the most popular ideas for inheritance, which we just talked about last time. It's not exactly correct. Hmm. Really interesting to think back in the day when they, they didn't know and they were looking for the mechanism, trying to come up with an explanation. Like, well, how in the world is information passed? Like, how does your body know go bald or not, and because clearly there's some genetic component there, but yeah, they, they didn't even have the vocabulary to talk about it in terms that we do today. And Luna Lovegood has a good question. How do you know when traits are going to be dominant or not? Mm -hmm. um, through experiments and observation, but we will be talking more about traits in the next lesson. Good question. And it's Lamarckism. Nice job, Unbeatable Science Kids. So it's a, a theory that's no longer accepted today. But it was one of the most popular ones when Mendel was alive. True or false, Mendel's research had a strong influence on other scientists living at the time, such as Charles Darwin. Hmm. We have a strong winner here, Math Dad. Look at that. I like seeing that bar grow. It's just that one bar, it just barely misses our heads. <laughs> it means the unbeatable science kids know the correct answer. But that probably is, is what it means, okay. Do we have confetti ready? Oh, if they get all five, they, they get confetti? Yep. All right, well, let's see. On this one, the answer is false. So that the research just didn't get spread around. So when you're at a, an obscure monastery somewhere and you, you write it up, and publicize it in German at the, at the time. It just it didn't catch on. I don't think they understood the significance of it. Yep. And, and I'd say a lot of scientific work is that way. There's, it's, it's hard to Do, get your notes. Doing, your... doing the work is important, but communicating the results well is equally important. And in Mendel's case, it just they didn't appreciate what he had discovered. And finally, what was the ratio that Mendel observed in the F2 generation? Was it four to one, three to one, two to one, or one to one? So when he did his experiments, there was a certain ratio that popped up over and over and over again. Do you remember what ratio that was? 
Gotta say, it really was a cool idea to get the, the true breeding purple ones, the true breeding white flowers, and then say, all right, let's have at it. Let's see which one's gonna win, purple or white. And you know what? I think anyone could have thought of that experiment, but then to do the next generation, and this F2 generation that this question is about, that's where it became so brilliant. Well, and also he picked the right organism to study because there are some traits where you really do see blending. Remember how we mm. talked about blending, how some flowers, if you have a red flower and a white flower, the next generation will be pink. That does happen for certain traits, but it didn't happen with Mendel's peas. And three to one is correct. So we that F2 generation had just a really interesting yeah, cross there. So here's your confetti. Good job, unbeatable science kids. And now we, Math Dad made a short, silly video for you as well. Hooded seals have a stretchy cavity or hood in their nose. Adult males can inflate and extend this hood so that it stretches across the length of their face in order to attract females' attention during mating season and to show aggression toward other males. You weren't impressed. Well, and because the balloon was pink, you could see the top of my head here oh. coming through in the when we played it, so that was kind of funny. I was like, why am I in the balloon? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, in real life, I do not like balloons at all. I'm not a fan of balloons, so that would not have worked, Math Dad. <laughs> in, our, in our next lesson, we will be talking all about different traits and why sometimes traits are dominant and other times they are recessive and the vocabulary that you need to have to be able to further understand and and start to apply the rules of genetics until then work hard grow smart and we'll see you next time <laughs>